With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, oh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Thank you so much for giving us the most precious thing you have, your time. As we do what we always try to do here, we're going to turn down the noise of the news cycle, talk about some things that actually matter underneath all that hollering and caterwauling, so we can better understand the times we live in by properly discerning some information. We're going to have a little fun today, too. Heavy day, September 11th. We'll get into that in just a minute as we remember that day and how the world kind of changed for a lot of us. Uh, Nicholas Steelman is on the program today. Glad to have him talking about the farm bill. Congress comes back into session. It's going to be a mess of a congressional session for the fall term. We got spending bills that have to pass. There's a looming government shutdown. Is there going to be an impeachment? The Senate doesn't want anything to do with anything the House is doing. It's going to be a mess. The farm bill is central to all this. Another one of these must pass bills. Why must we pass it? I'm going to talk about all that. Nicholas Steelman on the program today. Also, thrilled to have Luis Mendez back, our film critic friend, double board certified. He doesn't just do this on the internet. He actually knows what he's doing. He's a member of professional organizations. He talks about not just the movies and reviewing them, but also the business behind them. Talk about how the strikes affecting them. Talk about how the summer box office went with Barbie and Oppenheimer and everything else that went on. Some movies that did really well that you might not know did really well. Also talk about looming award season. Luis Mendez back on the program. Love having him on to talk movies, lighten things up. We're going to end the program with a great story about private pilots out in California and Washington, and now they're starting to go nationwide. Look, private pilots have to get their hours in. They have to fly so many cross-country missions. They have to do it anyway. Why not do it for a good cause? And in this case, moving animals from places that are oversaturated shelters to places that are underserved and have a need for them so that less and less of them are euthanized. Great story at the Los Angeles time. We'll end on a good note like we always do. But first, let's talk about that thing that we're going to do on days like this. September 11th, if you're of a certain age, I am. It's just one of those defining moments uh, in your life, in history, things like this. But what do you do with it? You know, now we're 22 years on from it. Uh, September 11th, I can tell you where I was that morning. I can tell you everything about that day from the time I woke up. I'd work night shifts. I'd woke up when the attack started. I can tell you everything about it. It's seared in my memory. A lot of people can do that. I wonder sometimes if that's the best way to remember these days. I uh, asked him somebody this morning, I was was like, I don't know how much 9-11 I can do on 9-11. Um, and they replied to me, well, not everybody compartmentalizes like you. Let's take that term for a second. I do. I compartmentalize. I've last few years, I've done something on 9-11. Um, Tom Gerard, uh, the very excellent piece from the Esquire um, about the falling man. I'm going to link to it in the Substack notes, uh, herdtell.substack.com. One of the finest pieces of writing you'll ever read anywhere on any subject. I put it out every 9-11. And I make myself read it every 9-11. I already read it this morning. One of the first things I did when I got up. It's out of Esquire. It is paywalled, by the way, but you can find it other places. But it's worth paying for it just to read this. I make myself read it. It's a very hard read. I let those emotions come. I think about that morning and what I felt. I think about the things that um, all of us go through, if you can remember 9-11. I think about things like... You know, the 350 plus firefighters who went in knowing they probably weren't coming back and went anyway. All the police officers, all the first responders, all the people that just went to work that morning and didn't come home, all the thousands and thousands of friends and family and loved ones who have dealt with the loss since then. Talk about the Pentagon also. Talk about Flight 93 and what those brave folks did. There's a lot involved there. You think about how our country changed and the world changed. Both good and bad, mistakes were made, things were done correctly. A lot of history over the last 20 plus years. There's a lot of sadness and grief dealing with the enormity of it that people would want to do that kind of harm and kill that many innocent people over, you know, extreme ideology and just good old fashioned hatred. There's things to be proud of, like 
how our first responders handled those things, like how our country came together, albeit briefly, but they did come together. I'm proud that my phone rang. I was on active duty at the time. I'd actually worked night shifts. So they, about the time I saw the second tower get hit, and by the time I was upstairs and about had my boots back on, they were calling to bring your A-bag and report for duty. I'm proud my phone rang. I was one of the fortunate few that we could actually do a little something about it over the coming years. But what do you do with this? There's an old saying about you can't really put a period on grief. You know, you can't ever make it go away. Time kind of changes it and dulls it and takes the edge off it. Grief and trauma are complicated things. But what do you do? People that know me accuse me of compartmentalizing. And I do for a lot of reasons. 9-11 is one of those things I compartmentalize. Days like today, I will read The Falling Man. I will think about it. I will think over all the ramifications of it. I'll let those emotions come in today for a little while. Not long, for a little while. And then I'll put it aside and get on with it. Now, everybody deals with things differently, but that's how I do it. How do you process all those deaths? How do you process the wars that followed? How do you process years of trauma and grief? Well, everybody's got to answer that question themselves. I've started to veer away from things like social media and the news media and the remembrances a lot on days like this. Again, this is just me talking to you. Okay. I will break out Falling Man and read it because it puts the focus where it needs to be, not on the geopolitics, not on the ideology, not on the wicked people that did it. It focuses on people that you mostly don't know their names and people that you mostly don't think about except on the anniversaries. And for just a few moments, you can remember them and try to think about what it was like for them and their loved ones since then. And you can put yourself in that moment again, whether you watched it on TV like I did or the survivors or the friends and family members who have a hole from someone who never came home. Take a moment and let that in. But then there has to be a point where we get on with it. Grief can be crippling. It can be terrorizing. C.S. Lewis talked about grief being a lot like fear. What we need to do, though, In whatever way you do it, and however way you do it, you need to use things like grief and trauma and anger for a positive, for what comes next, for whatever lies in the days ahead, not just in the days of over 20 years ago now, and all the days that came in between. A lot of good days, a lot of bad days. A lot of those days directly came from what happened on 9-11. But we do have to get on with it. You have to get up and carry on. We're on this earth for a little while longer, those of us that did not die on that day. And as long as the Lord tarries, as my father would say, we have to keep being about the work, the work of life, the work of caring for each other, the work of making our families, communities, and country better, one little thing at a time. 9-11 was a really big thing. One thing we've learned since then, and we know from all of human history, we do really good at the big things. We responded to 9-11. We came together as a country. We remember well. We memorialize well. We rebuild well. We need to be really faithful in the little things, like how we turn our grief and anger into making the world a better place now, tomorrow, and the day after. And that is imminently in our control, which 9-11 was not. Remember, let yourself feel those emotions but let it be a catalyst for good things to come. More Hertel right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, new face to the program. Always good to talk to new friends. Talk a little bit about the Farm Bill, one of those annual things that goes through no matter what. 
frankly, that's the problem. Nicholas Thielman uh, is at the Cato Institute. He's at the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. He's also a Young Voices contributor, and he's from Cleveland, but we will not hold that against him for the purposes of this conversation. How are you, sir? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on, Andrew. All right, so the Farm Bill has become, it's almost a joke. The DOD funding bill, military funding bill, Farm Bill, education, they have to pass these because of the troops and for the kids and for the farmers. Mm -hmm. But more and more and more, these have just become catch-alls where you jam other stuff in and doesn't really have anything to do with the farmers at all. You're writing in real clear um, policy here, but this is kind of become an annual thing with this Farm Bill. This year's version is just a variation on the theme, isn't it? This thing's kind of getting abused and becoming another one of those crisis legislation things like, oh, well, whatever, we can't pass anywhere else. We'll slot it in the farm bill because you're not against farmers, are you? Oh, absolutely not. No, I mean, my grandfather was uh, worked with farmers. He delivered fuel for them. Uh, he owned farmland. So I come from an agricultural family. Um, it's just the problem is that the farm bill doesn't actually support a lot of the small farmers that it purports to. Most of the subsidies, and, and this year it's projected that it's going to cost about $69 billion over the next decade in terms of the like value of these subsidies. Most of that goes to very large, already financially successful agricultural companies and farmers. So I love farmers. I love the small farmers, the little, you know, medium-sized farmers, but this is not who is being helped primarily by the farm bill. One of the things we need to do here is go over the nomenclature, though, because farmers is one of the it's almost like saying the defense industrial complex. Well, it's not actually a defense industrial complex anymore. It's three companies. It's consolidated. Our terminology yeah. in farming has not kept up with the times because there are still family run farms and mm -hmm. then there's corporate farms. And then there's the mega conglomerate, the ConAgras of the world who mm -hmm. own massive farmings. And then there's even a billion on that. There's another level of things like in pork production with Smithfield, where you have China owning a large portion of it. We really need to break down that there's different kinds of farm and farming going on before we can accurately discuss the topic. So go through the nomenclature a little bit because those different groups, they get different kinds of subsidies. They get different kinds of government funding. They get different kinds of corporate interests. The small farmer is out there, but that's only one part of the story, isn't it? And we got to get that centered before we start talking about whether the legislation is good or not, don't we? Yeah. So small farms really make up a majority of the farm, like smaller family farms make up a large percentage of the farms that are out there that are still in the, like, the non-farm employment sectors, or I'm sorry, the farm employment sectors. But the majority of those do not make sell more than a thousand dollars worth of crops per year, um, and a majority of the agricultural output in the economy actually come from about ten percent of uh, farms that are out there. Most of those are large agricultural, uh, are run by large agricultural cor corporations, or are uh, what are called large family farms, which are again these sort of like multi-million dollar operations. So there are medium and small farms out there, but a majority of them are not producing a majority of the output or are not receiving a majority of these subsidies. Um, it's mostly coming from a small handful of very large agricultural corporations and these what are called large family farms. And we know from history, once you get, let's take something like the ethanol thing in Iowa, because we're going to talk about Iowa for the election, right? Every every election cycle, we got to talk about ethanol and subsidies in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Once you get a subsidy involved, now you're talking political power because you're talking about money. And when money goes somewhere, votes are going to go that way. It skews who gets what in these pieces of legislation based on who has the power and who has the money. And that's why, even though family farms are still that 96, 97 percent, depending on what number you want to use, they're not the big money makers. And thus, these things like the farm bill, they start getting skewed a little bit, even though they put family farms on the title. Is that a fair way to lay it out? Yeah. And I mean, I would just like to point out, like, you know, even when we're talking about sort of like this, like the non sort of like mega corporations that are in agriculture. I mean, according to just the U.S. Bureau, uh, U.S. Census Bureau, the median farm household income in 2021 was about 30 percent above the median household income for the rest of the United States. So even when we're talking about these kind of smaller operations, they're not impoverished. You know, th this isn't like the grapes of wrath or something like that. Like these people 
are doing are well above the sort of the median in terms of their income or wealth status. The number is staggering, but we've become immune to numbers. You talk about it in your piece. Again, it's on Real Clear Markets. We're going to link to it. Read the whole piece. We've also got some links in there that you need to read through the links to get the full picture on this thing. Mm-hmm. $1.5 trillion over a coming decade. That's a huge number, but we've become immune to numbers like that, especially post-COVID where it was trillion here, trillion there, trillion there. What does that number actually mean? I know you broke it down to the commodity payment programs. That's $69 million of the $1.5 trillion. The numbers yeah. are so big, we just kind of roll our eyes and it just goes over our head. But what does that number actually mean when it comes to this legislation? So the $1.5 trillion is both the sort of farm programs, the subsidy programs that are kind of the traditional sort of bread and butter of agricultural policy and supports, and then also include things like uh, SNAP benefits that has been rolled into the farm bill back in the 60s and 70s. And then also you have added in things like disaster payments, various ad hoc programs that um, are funded, but are not sort of written into legislation. And then you also have conservation programs and environmental programs that are used to sort of help uh, promote environmentally friendly agriculture. But really all that does is just, um, again, just provides more payments to these rather large farms. Yeah. And Nicholas Steelman joining us. What happens here is something that we've always had to discuss when it comes to any kind of subsidy, doesn't matter what, but especially in agriculture, because agriculture runs on a cycle. You have to plant during a certain time of the year. Prices come out a certain time of the year. You harvest a certain time of year. There, there's a real circadian rhythm to how agriculture, whether it's a major corporation or a family farm, you know, it goes in the ground a certain time, comes out. There's a rhythm to this. Part of the problem with the subsidies and like you brought it up is not only the market effect, it really becomes kind of a trap for these farms where now you're chasing the subsidy instead of chasing the markets for the whatever the product, whether it's agricultural, whether it's, you know, pork or beef or whatever. It becomes a trap because now you're adjusting an entire industry based on the subsidies instead of the market. Put that in a practical application for us, what that means to us. You break it down in the piece. Just walk us through it a little bit because, again, once you subsidize something, you're changing it artificially, even if it's a good subsidy for the best intended reasons, it's going to do that. Just walk us through what that means practically for these farms. So it means that they're going to spend a lot of time uh, and resources kind of lobbying to maintain these subsidies. And that entails a cost to not only to these farms, but also to the economy as a whole, because there are now scarce resources being used up in sort of attaining economic economic privileges in one form or another, be they subsidies or tariff protections, favorable credit uh, programs from the federal government. All these various things require lobbying. So the rent-seeking costs that are entailed are pretty significant. But then also on top of that, also over time, a lot of the value of these subsidies actually get capitalized into the value of specialized resources that are used in the production of these various subsidized crops. So land values appreciate, equipment costs go up, fertilizer costs go up. If you have to hire specialized laborers, they'll typically increase their asking prices to be hired away. Um, And a lot of that means that over time, the actual value of the subsidies gets eroded until the point where essentially, you know, put it in economic terms, the recipients of those subsidies are only earning what are called normal returns or normal profits. They're not the actual excess value of them has been whittled away through essentially competition and input markets. And again, as I uh, note in the piece, increasing the ability of farmers to pay for these inputs, which again, bids up the prices. Yeah. All right. So you've got alternative in your job title. Give us an alternative here because everybody would probably agree like, yes, we understand the family farm in Ohio or Indiana can't compete with ConAgra. I'm not trying to pick on ConAgra. They're just big, you know, name whatever conglomerate you want. Um, We understand there's a competitive imbalance there. We understand that we want family farms to continue to thrive and they are on the decline, although it's not as bad as the media portrayal, but it is a decline. 
What's a better way to help them here besides just a subsidy program? Obviously, the government has a role in regulating agriculture, but what's a better way to do this? Give us those alternatives. What's a better way to do it without just a straight subsidy that ends up turning into a, a race to get the subsidy instead of doing what we need to do, which is taking care of our food supply, taking care of our farmers, taking care of our internal logistics when it comes to something as important as agriculture? So I think the best way, example, to kind of show what a free market system or agricultural system would look like is probably presented by New Zealand. New Zealand was a lot like a lot of countries um, pretty much up till the 1980s. They heavily subsidized agriculture. They provided price supports for various crops. They provided subsidies for inputs. They protected certain industries and so on and so forth. Then in the 80s, because of mounting budget deficits and the fact that they were essentially monetizing a lot of that debt, the inflation that that was causing. Um, they completely did away with this whole regime of price supports and agricultural subsidies. And nowadays, according to a study that was performed by the New Zealand government back in 2017, a lot of that, uh, the agricultural sector in New Zealand is thriving. I mean, the actual number of people who are employed then is not that much different from the way it was, from the number that it was pre, uh, doing away with these subsidies. And then on top of that, they've also seen productivity gains. It's become a much more efficient sector. So the whole idea that, you know, we need to be providing these massive government supports to agriculture for the sector to uh, thrive is just, you know, shown to be completely false by the example of New Zealand. Yeah, Nicholas Seelman joining us. We can't take out the political aspect of this. You mentioned it. Excuse me. We can't take the political aspect of this out. You mentioned it in your piece, though. There's an electoral incentive. We already talked about there's a circadian rhythm to how agriculture goes. There's a rhythm to elections. We know we're going to go to Iowa and have a debate about farms and subsidies and ethanol and all that because we do it every four to eight years, depending on whether you have an incumbent. One party or the other is going to make that pilgrimage, and they're going to make the same speeches we've always heard. How do we change the conversation about this? Because we know politicians are going to bring the pork home and you know, it's not popular, but there needs to be some pork coming home for politicians because that's part of their jobs to take care of the constituency. Mm -hmm. How do we change the conversation on this on our level, in our social media, in our conversations of, well, yeah, the farm in the heartland is going to be a really important thing or, you know, mining in West Virginia and Wyoming or tourism in Florida or whatever these industries are for these political power centers. How do we talk about it in a better, more productive way to try to maybe break that cycle a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so the problem is that, you know, agricultural policy, the farm bill topics generally are just they're not very sexy issues. Like, you know, most people probably couldn't tell you what the, the farm bill is, much less, you know, all the various programs that are kind of wrapped into it. Um, I think the primary focus should be upon not only like the fiscal costs that are entailed by these um, programs, but also pointing out that essentially these play to nothing more than very narrow special interest groups that are in some politically salient constituencies and certain geographically concentrated areas. Um, then on top of that, I mean, I don't go into this in the piece, but there are significant environmental uh, costs that are entailed by these programs because it incentivizes farmers to over uh, utilize things like fertilizer, various pesticides, try and get higher yields out of their ground. And that that all contributes to environmental problems that we're seeing. Um, and on top of that, you know, you can kind of go into the issues of environmental justice and the way that impacts sort of small, lower income communities where a lot of these, whether it be the burning of sugarcane fields and the smoke that produces going into lower income neighborhoods or the way that runoff kind of affects places like Detroit or Toledo, which are on the lower in end of the income spectrum. A lot of that kind of goes into the issues that are produced by the uh, by these farm subsidy programs. And that's kind of a good way to kind of focus, refocus the conversation is not only focusing on the fiscal costs, but also the environmental and social costs. Yeah, Nicholas Thielman, this is going to get wrapped up into the uh, fall session of Congress. We know it's going to be an ugly session of Congress. There's a lot of talk about government shutdown. This is one of about 12 bills they put under must pass legislation. So we know this is going to be lumped in with some other stuff. Give folks one or two things to look for in the headlines to come among all the noise we're going to have. And of course, it's an election year on top of everything else coming up in 2024. 
it's going to be a lot of loud noise out of Congress. Give them one or two things about this specific bill to watch for in the headlines about whether it's moving, the compromise involved. You already mentioned there's going to be a real fight over the SNAP benefits in it. And of course, that brings up poverty and kids and all that. Give us a couple things to watch for in headlines to pick out to keep an eye on this as we go forward through the fall and the winter of Congress shenanigans. Um, I would say just definitely keep an eye out for uh, crop insurance uh, programs like ARC and PLC, which are these massive sort of subsidy programs that subsidize farmers when the price of crops fall below a certain national average. Those are rather expensive programs, but also very valuable programs to the constituencies that receive them receive them. And I would say just keep an eye out for their reauthorization. Uh, as I point out in one of the pieces, when several congressmen went and visited to their constituents in Indiana, crop insurance is one of the primary top topics. So that's definitely going to be a big issue when it comes to reauthorization uh, this coming fall. Yep. He's with the Cato Institute and one of our great young voices contributor. Glad to have him on the program. Until we get you back, my friend, let folks know where they can follow you, what you have going on, how they can keep up with you until we see you again. I'm on at Nick, I'm on Twitter at, at Nick Fieldman, or I guess X nowadays. And uh, it can also be found on LinkedIn. Um, and also you can look at my author page at uh, uh, the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives website. We'll link to all those. We're going to link to this piece in Real Clear Markets on the Farm Bill. Make sure you read it and share it and discuss it with your friends. Nicholas Thielman, appreciate the time today. Look forward to talking again, sir. Hey, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. He is back. We haven't got to talk to him for a while. He's our go-to when we want to talk not just movies and films for the reviews, but also the business, what's going on, big picture and entertainment. And boy, howdy, is there a whole bunch of stuff going on. Luis Mendez, Mendez Movie Report. How are you, sir? Great to see you back. Uh, doing pretty good. Uh, I wish I could say I felt that way about the movie year in general, but uh, I am hopeful that things are about to pick up uh, as we enter the final quarter of the year. Well, money-wise, they're doing good. This has been a good summer money-wise, blockbuster-wise, but it's been a little strange. Of course, you had um, Barbie and Oppenheimer kind of tent-poled the summer. Uh, we'll talk about them in a minute because I want to take them together because I think they actually did help each other in a way. People forget. I was just looking at the box office for 2023 as we get into the fall. Folks have real short memories on stuff like this. You're looking at the top 10. The Mario Brothers movie was a monster. Um, it's at number two behind Barbie right now. Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is still kind of creeping around out there. They're up to four. Then you get Oppenheimer. Little Mermaid, you know, a little bit. Some folks liked it. Some folks didn't. But, you know, Disney knows what they're doing. It's in sixth. Avatar Way of Water in seven. Ant-Man and Wasp at eight. You know, another Marvel thing. And then you get John Wick, Sound of Freedom, Indiana Jones and Mission Impossible, big franchises. It's a lot of the same what sticks out to you on that list? I mean, obviously, the Mario Brothers was a little bit of a surprise. Everybody kind of knew Barbie was going to be a juggernaut. But what jumps out at you on that list is we're about three quarters through the year here. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest box office story of the year is easily Oppenheimer. Uh, I, I understand that folks are going crazy about Barbie and Mario, but those are IP uh, products like it, there, there was always a chance that we're going to be billion dollar makers. Uh, granted, I, I thought Mario would be a billion dollar maker. I didn't necessarily think Barbie would. I think I thought it would come close, but it's definitely exceeded my expectations box office wise. Uh, but Oppenheimer, you know, I, I remember like we were talking about this in 2021, 2022. These kind of movies just don't make the kind of money that they used to. Uh, you know, this, these kind of like Oscar bait films that explore like tar darker topics, uh, historical figures. I mean, even Steven Spielberg uh, can't bring people to the uh, theater like he used to. Uh, West Side Story didn't do that great at the box office. Fablements definitely didn't do that good at the box office. So to me, this shows that Nolan has somehow been able to create almost 
sort of a franchise onto himself, which is something that's becoming harder and harder for our tours to pull off in this uh, day and age where franchises and IP products dominate the box office. So to me, and not to mention that this came out the same weekend as Barbie did. Now, granted, maybe the whole uh, Barbenheimer meme stuff helped, but still, we don't see that. Usually there's like one movie every week that comes out in the weekend that sort of eats up the other movies. So to me, Oppenheimer is easily the biggest and most impressive box office story of the year. Yeah, and the thing about Nolan is I think there's a little bit of a reputation thing going on there. Look, Nolan, nobody doubts his you know creative ability, his genius with film. Um, I'm one of those guys, though, that I think he works better with guardrails. I'm not really a big fan of the Tenant and Inception stuff. I know Inception was really cool the first time you do it, but it, it's also, you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Let's just leave it at that. The Tenant stuff, of course he did, you know, Dark Knight and the Batman trilogy, people go to that one. I was really excited to see him with this subject matter because I'm one of those guys. I, I appreciate his talent, but I don't always like what he gives me. Is that a fair way to say it? So when he got this subject matter of Oppenheimer, I was really curious what he would do with it. I was super impressed with it. I'll actually link to my own review on this. I did think it was a little long. I think he could have got 20 minutes out of that without really hurting the movie any. But I thought it had a lot of brilliance in it. Not a perfect movie, but a whole lot of high spots. I think a lot of people just wanted to see what Nolan would do. And plus, it's just really cool to say, like, hey, I want to go see what a what a really talented director does with an atomic bomb going off. Is that kind of a fair way to lay it out? I mean, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, I cannot, uh, He definitely took a hit with Tenet. Uh, I'm not personally, I'm a Tenet defender. It was one of my favorite movies of 2020. But I'll be also one of the first people to tell you that that's a messy movie. It's I don't rank it particularly high among his filmography. Um, and, and he really, I think he got into a situation with, uh, I, I think, uh, I want to say the director is David Lean, who was the one who directed... Um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. He, he was known for directing these massive epics, and as time went on, he, his movie started to like lose that steam. And then eventually, um, he came out with a, a passage to India, and some people thought that he, by him, kind of like not not um, having having things more simplified in the story, that it kind of allowed him to go back to his roots. Maybe that's what we're seeing with Nolan at the moment. And I think Oppenheimer has the ability to become sort of have that, when I think of like the greatest like biopics, or at least what are generally considered the greatest biopics, Lawrence of Arabia, Gandhi, um, I think this has the potential to join those kind of films. Uh, it, it it is it is an epic. It's a three hour film. I do agree with you. It there I did see moments that could have been cut off, um, but I will say I didn't feel the runtime as much as I thought I would when I went to see it in theaters with my friend. Um, I was very interested to see that I was in a packed movie theater to see a movie like that. Usually, people like me when we go see certain films like this uh, were very few in the theater. Um, and at the moment, I would say that Oppenheimer is easily the current front runner to win Best Picture. Whether it'll actually do that, that's another story. But I do think this is probably Nolan's greatest shot to actually finally win that director Oscar. Yeah, I was really impressed with it, even though I, I, I picked a few things apart on it. I thought the sound design was not good and hurt the movie. And in fact, I, I wrote about it. My, my, my other daughter was actually in the Barbie movie in a different theater and they could actually hear Oppenheimer coming through the wall of the theater while they were watching Barbie. That's how loud that thing is. So that, but little things like that, but it, it is a brilliant picture. I think it's going to age really well. Um, I actually think it might be better at home because of that sound design thing. Here's something else. The Barbie movie, of course, pink elephant in the room. That's been the juggernaut. The super Mario brothers movie has kind of the same thing. The, you call them IP property movies, and that's fair. All the Mario Brothers is a video game, but it's a lot bigger than a video game now. It's kind of its own thing. I'm worried, and I've seen some critics go this. I think the studios are going to learn the wrong lesson from those successes. I don't think they understand, you know, we're going to get a lot of these product placement movies now. We're going to get a lot of toy movies, video game movies, things like that, these IP things. But I'm afraid the studios and some of the directors aren't going to learn the right lesson of, no, it can't just be an IP that's successful. It has to be an IP that people connect with 
And then the movie has to tap into that connection because those are two really different things because, hey, that's not the first Super Mario Brother we ever saw. Like, I like the campy 80s one, but it didn't work. Like, everybody kind of agreed. These things can go bad in a hurry if they don't adhere to that principle of getting to what made it popular in the first place and portraying that on the film, right? Well, yes. I mean, the studio's learning the wrong lessons. Uh, I mean, that can you could argue that it goes back all the way to the beginning of movies if you really do your history. I mean, how many crappy slasher films did we get after Halloween and Friday the 13th? You know, like, um, I, I do think so, especially now that the superhero franchise has been uh, really kind of running to the ground at this point, and there's been a lot of, like, debate as to whether there's a superhero fatigue maybe the next big thing you're going to see them try to do is to uh use these toy products or video game products and do, do try to do a bunch of sequels off of them uh, i i'm pretty sure we'll get a mario sequel apparently there's already talk about a barbie sequel there's talk about creating a freaking cinematic universe off of toy stuff uh i i would agree that's the wrong lessons oh, look i I'm in the minority. I, I was kind of mid on both Mario and Barbie, but I can't deny that they were ridiculously popular films with good audience scores. Um, and I think the studios, what the studios should do, if that if they do really want to capitalize off it, I actually don't mind if they want to do a sequel, but you got to have a good script. You have to give it a, a, a reason to exist. To just do, to just pump stuff out to get money, uh, that's how you end up with a situation where we're, with what we're seeing right now with superhero movies, where it's just kind of been running to the ground. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Main. Church and Main is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics, from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutans. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. Yeah, Lewis Mendez, Mendez Movie Report. Double border certified critic, by the way. He doesn't just do this. He actually knows what he's talking about. I got to ask you about the weirdest box office path on a movie I've seen in a very long time. Um, Disney and Pixar's Elemental came out. This thing was dead on arrival. Nobody went and watched it. All of a sudden, and again, these numbers I'm using, these are the domestic ones because worldwide gets skewed a little bit. All of a sudden you go and look, do you realize that thing made more money than Fast 10? 
and it made more money than something like Dungeons and Dragons, which was considered a big surprise hit and critics and audiences like this thing just kept chugging along. Nobody paid any attention. All of a sudden you look up worldwide. It's done even better. All of a sudden, this thing's in the top 15 movie makers. This thing was dead when it came out. Nobody talked about it. How in the world did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I, for, I'm ecstatic that it happened because personally, Elemental's my second favorite of the year behind Oppenheimer so far. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that it got mixed reviews, uh, but I know audiences reacted to it much better. But yeah, I, I, I think what ended up happening, because it's really kind of harder to see a movie like these movies uh, grow legs, but also it's just the, the the worldwide box office component of it. I mean, a lot of people wonder, well, how did those Transformers movies back then, how did they make so much money? Well, it's because they did better worldwide. I mean, if you go and look at the box office of, say, The Mummy, the Tom Cruise version that didn't do too great, it did bet much better at the uh, worldwide box office. Uh, uh, Godzilla, my guy, King of the Monsters, was helped, its box office was helped much by its worldwide grows. So I think what happened is that with Elemental, it came out, came out during the same weekend as The Flash, which itself didn't particularly do as well as WB was hoping, but uh, Elemental just kind of came out. No one really caught on to it over here in the States. And I mentioned the issue that's been going on where people have been kind of starting to be conditioned to watch Pixar on Disney Plus. And then, but just something picked up with the worldwide box office. The worldwide box office, uh, it did much better worldwide. The legs started to pick up as word of mouth spread. And I think it just led to the situation where the movie sort of quietly was able to just pick up steam as more and more people told other people that, hey, this this might be something worth taking the kids out to see. Um, I'm, I'm ecstatic uh, to, you know, like I said, to see this because I – I was kind of down on the fact that uh, a movie that I liked so much didn't do too hot, but it, it's always nice to see this because it gives you hope that if a movie doesn't have the greatest opening week and that it can make up for it in the weeks ahead, which is getting harder and harder to do in a day and age where everything is so front loaded to that first weekend. Yeah. Speaking of big movies that would have been front loaded, Dune got pushed back. This is a big deal. Um, this was going to be one of the big mo monster movies at the end of the year. Everybody was really looking forward to it. Dune one was really well respected and folks were looking forward to this for folks that don't understand the post-production on something like Dune is ridiculous. It's probably four to one to actual shooting, something like that. So that's why the strike stuff hits something that's already been completed like that. That's just the big name one. There's going to be a lot of movies like this. Stuff's going to start sliding. And stuff's going to start moving. And it's going to happen right about the time award season kicks off. It's going to bleed into next year probably, it looks like, because of production schedules. Dune's the headliner, but there's a lot of this going on behind the scenes in the movie industry right now, isn't it? There's just a lot of uncertainty. Well, yes, because of the strikes. And the, these strikes are definitely looking like some of the longest that w in the movie industry history period. And there is a possibility that we end up with a 2020 type of situation where COVID pushed a lot of movies out. It ended up being a very small movie year. Uh, now, it hasn't been a sm very small movie year yet so far, but it, it can instantly get that way for the rest of the year. Doom Part 2 getting pushed too much, which, by the way, also pushed the upcoming MonsterVerse film. So as a Godzilla fan, that, that was an extra layer of annoying to me. Uh, two movies I'm anticip highly anticipated got pushed back. Um, but also, it, it's going to affect award season. Doom Part 2 being pushed back, I think, almost guarantees that Barbie is a picture contender. Um, I don't think it's a contender to win, but maybe the, the, the nomination would be the win, like it was with Top Gun Maverick. Um uh, and then on top of that, I think there is a possibility that other movies are going to get pushed back. I think Color Purple, which is right now slated to come out around Christmas time, I could see WB pushing that back to next year. Um, I think there is, you know, the, the the longer these strikes happen, the more the series are going to say these bigger tentpole movies that we typically need our actors out there selling. We're going to have to push that back to next year when hopefully the strikes are over. Um, I, I'm hopeful that things will get resolved sooner than people think, but I think there is a possibility that this could be in for, we're in for a long winter and more movies will get delayed because unfortunately the studios, 
they seem to think that they can wait the uh, the writers and actors out, and uh, I honestly think that they're in denial because um, I I do think the writers and 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 actors are on their way to getting mostly what they want. Uh, it's just a matter of when the studios are finally going to budge. Yeah, Luis Mendez joining us. Is there a danger here? And setting aside the complicated parts of the strike stuff, the movie business, the theater, in theater movies, had one of its best years in a long, long time this summer. Between Oppenheimer and Barbie and just everything else, they, they, they've got some good momentum, some good PR from a good summer of pretty good box office receipts. Is there a fear and a danger here that that ground's going to get lost if you lose half a year or more to the strike stuff? If you don't have good stuff coming out in the theaters, some of that ground they clawed back is going to go right back out the door and right back to streaming at the houses. Is there still a concern of that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I've I've seen so many people who have talked about how con- that they're concerned about that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, maybe maybe Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, the upcoming Scorsese movie, ends up being a big hit. Uh, I mean, as much as I would like to see that, I'm a little skeptical because again, Oppenheimer aside, those kind of movies have struggled more at the box office of late. Um, I'm not sure if the Marvels is going to be the big thing for the MCU uh, that maybe the theaters would hope that it is. Again, I think Color Purple, which has the potential to become something massive, could be delayed. I don't think the Aquaman sequel is going to be as successful as the first one. Uh, Wonka, that could either become a really big deal or it can become a flop. Or it could just get pushed back to 2024 also because that could be something that WB tries to get more money from next year. Um, So I think there is a big concern about that. Um, And honestly, considering all the complicated machinations behind what's going on with the strikes and the fact that this is really driven by the new era of streaming and and what royalties uh, writers and actors can get from that, it's really going to be interesting to see how it does affect the movie theater. But again, if Killers of the Flower Room, which is coming out in early October, becomes a big hit, that's the kind of thing that could really help the movie theaters survive. Um, but if these bigger tentpole movies just keep getting delayed, like I fear they will, then absolutely it can take out it can take out a lot of good, the goodwill that theaters have been building back up with uh, these bigger movies. Mendez joining us. All right. The big kid on the block has had a very rocky year. Uh, They've had some successes, but business wise, Disney's got a couple of issues. Some of it's on the corporate side that's just flowing over into the entertainment. We know about, you know, the change in leadership back now. I think Disney is a real good test case here because they seem to have trapped themselves into a box of their own making was trying to figure out how to balance in theater IP properties and their streaming service. And they don't seem to have figured out the formula. They've kind of pushed it both ways now where they were. And I understand the pandemic pushed them this way, but they're like, well, we'll just release a whole bunch of stuff on Disney plus. They found out that that's not good. They've gone too far the other way a little bit. Now some stuff that probably should have went on Disney plus. They don't seem to have found that mix yet. If Disney can't get it right, I'm a little worried about other people like, you know, Warner Brothers Discovery getting it right. Um, I really don't like what they've done with the Max relabel, frankly, um, since they did that, although I do use that and I do have that. um, I think they botched an opportunity there. These big companies still haven't quite figured out the new mix yet, have they? And that's a big story for entertainment because it affects how these movies are getting released and it affects how they do, you know, long form series like the Star Wars stuff, like what HBO does with their, you know, real prestige series is feels like the mix just ain't there yet for these big companies. 
Uh, I would agree with that, though. I do think that there are certain companies that maybe are uh, are in bigger trouble than others. Others that are doing things a little bit better than others. So, I mean, the smaller stu- the smaller studios, the independent studios I know have signed, uh, have agreed to a lot of the demands going on with the strike. So that allows them to have their actors and, and um, out there campaigning and stuff. And I know that... Um, you know, obviously, original indie stuff is going to have a lot of more um, original content compared to the big stuff. But the big studios, I I would say that I've seen some potential for them kind of getting it right. I mean, Netflix has been doing pretty well at, as of late to get some new content in. I know they're trying to build their own branding. Um you know, but of course, Netflix doesn't have to worry about the theatrical like other major studios do. Uh, Disney, I would say, is probably the one that has had it the roughest of late because they haven't really been coming out with that much original content. They've been, you know, like if you look at their most successful live action movies, it's been the remakes of the animated classics. You know, a lot of their live action movies have flopped at the box office. Um, their animated movies have been kind of hit or miss in success. Uh, yet for every elemental, you have a uh, every elemental, every encanto, you have a light year or a strange world. Um, and I am worried. I would be worried about Disney in that uh, in terms of that. But to be fair, also Disney. If you if you ever study the history of Disney, they always have these up and down periods. And we have been in a bit of an era where Disney has dominated to a point that I've been thinking that it's due for them to have a little bit of humble pie. Cause it's been, it, this happens every single time with this company. But if the other studios make the same mistakes that Disney have been making, then I think you're going to be, then I think a lot of the good, again, this goes to that a lot of the goodwill that these theaters have been earning back can easily be canceled out. Um, if, if they don't learn these lessons or if they don't figure out that, this that this is a new era and that there's new rules to play by yeah Luis mendez it's interesting you phrase it that way um i'm just i'm just trying to think through this because normally there's there's kind of a circadian rhythm to theaters and film releases you know you have award season you have summer box office you're gonna have some horror stuff around you know halloween that kind of thanksgiving to christmas is a sweet spot for things that's where dune was supposed to go now it won't um Part of the strike thing and part of this is the rhythm of this is all going to get messed up now and it's going to throw things off. Give us a few things to pay attention to. Usually I ask you for upcoming movies, but with the strikes and stuff, that's going to be hard to do. Give us a couple things to watch for as we go into fall and especially we start getting into the holidays, which is usually a big business time and then award season right after that. What's the headlines we should be watching for that's either warning signs that things aren't on track or that this is going to go ugly, or that people should pay attention to and dig in beyond the headlines to see what's going on in the entertainment industry? I actually think the biggest headline to look at would be what's going on with Warner Brothers' uh, late-year uh, releases. Because if you look at where their schedule at, it, they seem a little too squeezed in together. Uh, now, usually when that happens, a studio eventually kind of spaces them out a bit. But if you start to see those movies get pushed to 2024, that's when you start. That's when you'll start to really know that there, there's a possibility that this could get really ugly. And at that point, if those movies are getting pushed, Dune Two, I would be surprised if Dune Two stays in March because they're going to eventually have to push other things back. So if you see something like Aquaman Two, Wonka, Color Purple getting pushed back, that would be a big red flag. Uh, now, so far, Disney has not really gotten involved in the game of pushing things back. But if you see, let's say that they decide we're going to push back the Marvels, that would be a massive red flag that things are going to get even uglier than we were uh, hoping, than we were fearing. Um, if Killers of the Flower Moon gets pushed back, that to me would be F5, category F5, holy crap. Because at that point, even award movies are getting pushed back. Um and now, to again, the smaller studios don't have to worry about this stuff, but the smaller studios aren't the movies that are driving box office. Um, they're not the movies that people tend to go see a lot. So to me, I would say keep those kind of headlines in, uh, in mind to see how bad this can really get. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting you brought up the Marvels, though, because the Marvels was slated for week two of Dune. It was really going to get buried. If I was Disney, I'd be ecstatic and leave it right where it's at because now it might actually do something. Because that, when I saw them put that as, as the week after Dune comes out, I'm like, oh, well, they're burying this. They want an excuse for when this doesn't go well. So if I was them, I'd leave that right where it was. Luis Mendez, love having you back, my friend. He's at the Mendez Movie Report on Substack. We're going to link to all that, but let folks know where else they can keep up with you, what you got going on, and how you're going to keep covering this crazy, crazy movie thing that's just going to get crazier for the foreseeable future, my friend. That's right, and I'm also going to be hope coming up with some classic movie stuff that I'm hoping to. I'm finally going to start working on my YouTube channel. But basically, uh, Mendes Movie RPT. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter. Um, if, you, if you've got a, a letterbox, anyone out there, that you can find me there. But really, if you just put MendesMovieReport.com, it should redirect you straight to my newsletter. And I have links to everything that I'm involved in right there. Yep, and our Substack, herdtell.substack.com. He is a recommended partner on there. We're happy to have you on board, my friend. And, and uh, I recommend Herdtell. Well, you ought to. We're awesome. No, <laughs> you, you do really good work. We appreciate you. You know, again, not just reviewing stuff. You actually understand how the business affects these things. That's an important component to a lot of this because, you know, Dune getting moved changes a lot of things, not just because Dune gets moved, because a lot of other movies were going to avoid Dune because that was going to be a tsunami. These things all work together. You explain it so well, my friend. Can't wait to have you back and talk more about it soon. Thank you so much for the time. Hey, no problem. Anytime. Yes, sir. Let's end on a good note. I love this story, not just because um, one of my great regrets in life is that uh, I quit flying aircraft, private planes, small private planes at the early age I did and haven't got back to it yet. Payday someday, maybe. But this is from the L.A. Times. Uh, Petra Janney nimbly climbs in and around her tiny 73 Piper Cherokee airplane. That's a good airframe. Preparing the crates inside to hold 17 dogs. She's confident and clearly in control. She's flown dozens of flights like these to save dogs from being killed in overcrowded shelters, but she has to move fast. It's 9 a.m. in late July at Meadows Field in Bakersfield, California, and already it's pushing 90 degrees. The heat isn't good for the K-9 cargo, and it'll probably be hotter still when she flies back to Whiteman Airport in Paco, Pacioma, I guess. Sorry, California, Pacioma. To turn the dogs over to Laura LaBelle, the co-founder of LaBelle Foundation Rescue in Los Angeles, to provide them medical care and nurturing foster homes until they can be adopted. She's in Bakersfield because California has a huge unwanted pet crisis, and Bakersfield feels like the epicenter. Other states have lots of unwanted pets, too, especially Florida and Texas, but California has the most dogs and cats coming into shelters, more than 160,000 a year. And the highest non-lived outcomes in the nation. That means they're going to put them down, for those of you from Logan. According to the National Database, shelter animal counts. That's a nice way of saying around 19% of those animals, more than 30,000 so far this year, will die in custody. Or put to sleep, as some call it, or euthanasia, primarily because the shelters were out of space. The Bakersfield Animal Care Shelter is a case in point. This year, they euthanized 200-plus dogs a month just to make room for the 150 new dogs coming in every week, Director Matthew Bucks says. Transportating the dogs out of the area is part of the coping strategy for the shelter. The staff regularly works with rescue organizations in and out of state to move the dogs to areas with fewer strays and greater demands. So there are buses who take bigger dogs up to Washington State or well-heeled donors who pay for chihuahuas to fly to Connecticut. And my chihuahuas don't even like the car. I can't imagine them in a plane. Uh, where the demand for that breed is high and the numbers are low. But today, Janie is flying and doing her part. The trip costs her at least $300 in fuel and rental fees, but it's money she'd have to pay out anyway to get the flight hours she needs as a private pilot. That's the ideal behind Amelia Air, the all-volunteer nonprofit animal rescue organization she founded. Private pilots need regular flight hours to maintain their license, so why not put all that time and expense toward a mission? Amelia Air is small, but it operates on both coasts, 
with Janie in the Los Angeles and co-founder Dean Honstead in Washington, D.C. They've rescued over 1,300 dogs, cats, and even a few ferrets, 310 animals this year alone, and more than half of those in California. Billy Air has a roster of about 20 volunteer pilots nationwide, but in California, Janie flies the bulk of the missions. This is her 12th flight this year, so she's all business ready in the plane. Now comes the hard part, the guard your heart part. It also makes it worthwhile picking up each dog to safely stow them for the flight. There's a bunch of pictures here, too. Make sure you check out the link on the hub sub stack. First, there's a litter of six hamster-sized newborns, some of them chihuahua mixes who came in the Bakersfield shelter with their umbilical cord still attached. Then there are the four slightly old puppies, pit bull mixes, who eyes are still tightly shut, futilely nosing around the crate for their mother who never made it to the shelter. The so-called bottle babies are the biggest reason she has to hurry because they can only go a few hours between feeding. Next is a vigilant fox-faced mother and her four rambunctious pups old enough to be weaned. Animal control officers found the mother with six pups abandoned in a locked crate. The rescue coordinator who brought the dogs to Janie this morning it said that the Unity Canine Express Rescue and all volunteer animal rescues that fosters puppies and dogs who are sick and injured found permanent placements for somewhere away from dog-saturated Bakersfield. The puppies were in horrible shape, Jackson says, super dehydrated, full of worms, emaciated. One puppy was already dead by the time they found him. The second died as soon as they got to the shelter. But a foster family was available to nurse the rest of the family. The mother watches quietly as Jackson talks. Her puppies gamble around her, looking healthy and excited now after a few weeks of good care. People can be evil, she says flatly. She takes a breath, and their work resumes. Once the mom and pups are in their new crate, Janie is ready for a final two adolescent wee collar dogs who tremble in their cages but melt into the arms of whoever picks them up. The large one, a scruffy terrier, is the last. He leans his head back against Janie as she prepares to load him and she can't stop to snuggle him back. She takes time to quickly nuzzle all the dogs before they enter the plane, but this guy's clearly special. He was a stray, Jackson said, running loose and then held in Bakersfield's cough in a shelter that's bulging with more than 300 dogs this week. Shelter is bursting at the steams. More than 4,100 dogs have come in so far this year, 700 more than last year. It's 175 kennel designed for one dog are each filled with two or three or even four dogs. Paradoxically, the adoptions are up 46%. Still can't keep up as city residents can get a dog spayed or neutered, vaccinated, microchipped with its ID tag for just $20 to cover the city's licensing fee for free if they live outside the city. But still, it's not enough. Janie is a pro at protecting her heart. She has two 11-year-old pit bulls at home. Nonetheless, once the plane is in the air, she pulls the scruffy straight from his carrier and holds him against her shoulder while he lies like a sleeping baby for the 30-minute flight. When they reach Whiteman, Janie turns him and the other dogs over to LaBelle, who whisks them away to waiting foster homes so they can be nurtured and assessed until dawn. There was a little bond, Janie admits little, but it's not that the rescue she gives up to keep her awake at night. It's the ones that we're not able to save. Cool story. What a great idea. Doing something you're going to do anyway and doing some good while you're doing it. Love it. Uh, check out the full piece. It's from the Los Angeles Times. It'll be in the substack, hertel.substack.com. Also in the show notes on whatever platform you're listening, except for iTunes, who doesn't let us do links for whatever reason. That'll do it for Hertel. Make sure you subscribe to that substack. Make sure you subscribe and follow on whatever platform you're listening or watching on iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio. Spotify, YouTube. The reason for that is a couple. One is we can keep track of who's watching and where so we can make sure we tailor the program and make sure you get it. Two is if you do us a favor, make sure you leave a comment and a rating on whatever those platforms are. That lets the platform know that our little program is worth them promoting and catching up on and promoting. Y'all been doing that. The numbers have been much, much higher the last few weeks. Really appreciate that. That's all you. We don't advertise here except for our own social media. So it's all word of mouth. Only ever will cost you a click, too, if you'll share it on your own social media. And we'd really appreciate that. Let folks know that her tell is worth the most precious thing that you also gave us their time. We won't ever waste it, and we appreciate it very much. So, till we see you next time, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. We'll talk to you again next time for more her tell. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested 
and learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late night comedy style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. They got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics. From the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com.